Um, I'm just going to go into the words. Um, I know that children ministry is my passion. Um, I've been doing it, I love it. And every time I go, I have an opportunity to talk to, ch to children ministers. You know, I am just happy to be among them because I know that working with children is not an easy task at all. Um, even people that are parents will know that even having your own children, it is not easy to raise them. You know, right from when they're popped out until they go into college, they get married, you know, it's never, your work as a parent is never done until you leave this earth. You know, um, I know my oldest is 13, so I'm still young in the business of making children, but I'm done. <laughs> uh, my, my, my youngest is seven, you know, so, but I'm done, but I know that it is not easy. Um, I know that um, the people that have children can um, attest to that. And this morning I am coming here, to, I'm bringing you a message um, that is going to talk to you um, about what you're doing, what you should be doing if you're not doing it yet, um, and the special gift that God has given to us that we have not really recognized. Some of us have recognized it and we're running with it. Some of us, we know it is there, but we don't know how to, how, how, how to help or how to do it. So this morning I've, I'm, I've come to talk to us about that. And I pray that even as you hear it, that the Lord Almighty will give you understanding Amen. of what I'm telling you, even as I speak, that the Lord Almighty will expand, you know, whatever I'm saying. I'm having make sense to you even more than I'm speaking this morning. And my, the message this morning is tied to change my heart. Amen. You know, when we say change my heart, you know, change my heart for whatever it is that God wants me to do. Um, also, I'm, there might be people in here this morning, I mean, what I'm talking about is going to be more about our children. I know that the pastor comes here every Sunday and speaks to us. They talk about your financial blessings, you know, they talk about prosperity, they talk about hearing from God, God's wisdom, God, you know, all of those things. But, you know, we really as a church hear about, you know, how to raise our children. Come on, amen. Whether you are, you are a mother, or father or not, whether you're married or not. I know that our prayer is that one day that we will have our own children. Amen. You know, whether physical children or spiritual children. Amen. That is every everyone's prayer, right? So that is why I've come this morning to talk to you about that. It is very uh, precious. You know, I tell the people in my, in, my, in my children's ministry, especially the ones in the baby's room, the nursery, you know, I tell them before they come in there, I tell them that you're coming into a very, very, very important ministry. That if you don't know that your ministry is, is very pre precious to God. Because you are coming, you are the first person that these little ones are going to come in contact with. You are the first person ever in their life that is going to tell them that Jesus loves them. How wonderful is that as a Christian? That you are the first to tell a little born baby that Jesus loves him or her. And then you're teaching them, you're nurturing them in the ways and the admonition of God. You know, so by the time you look at that, you know, I see my, my, my nursery teachers, they are all smiling on a Sunday morning. Come on, you know, even after service, they're smiling and going home yeah. because they know that I have come to do the work of my father. I have deposited something in this little child. He might not be listening that Sunday, he might be crying, she might be all over, but I have come to play my part. And I want us to listen very carefully. You know, it says, change my heart. There's a, there's a story, I don't know if anybody has ever read the story. It's a funny story, but I want you to listen as I read it. It says, one evening, a mother was busy fixing supper. Her little girl came up to her and gave her a piece of paper. She dries her hand, as the mother, on her apron and reads what the girl wrote on the paper. And this is what the girl wrote. It says, Dear Mom, for cutting the grass, five dollars. For cleaning up my room this week, one dollar. For going to the store for you, two dollars. For babysitting my, my kid brother while you went shopping, five dollars. Taking out the garbage, one dollar. The list went on. At the bottom of it, it said total owed. $17.75. I can imagine my seven-year-old telling me that. <laughs> well, the mother looked at her standing there, and the girl could see the memories 
flashing through her mind. The mother picked up the pen. She wrote, she turned over the paper. She turned over the paper she had written on, and in, in there she wrote, for the nine months I carried you, while you were growing inside of me, no charge. For all the night I have sat up with you, doctored and prayed for you, no charge. For all the trying times and all the tears that I have, that you have caused through the years, no charge. For all the time I wiped your nose, like I would say, sucked your nose <laughs> and your butt, no charge. For all the toys, food, clothes, no charge. When you add it up, the cost of my love for you is no charge. Wow. When the girl finished reading what her mother had written, there were big tears in her eyes and she looked straight at her mother and said, Mom, I sure do love you. And then she took the pen in a great big letter, she wrote, paid in full. Isn't that a beautiful story? Amen. You know, we do so much as parents. You know, when you look at parents, we do so much as parents. And you know, our, like I said, our work is never, never end. It, it never ends until we go to be with the Lord. Even when we are grandparents, you know, the parents, are, the children are still coming. And then the grandchildren are still coming. You still have, you still worry about them. You know, and when I read this story, I mean, it was such a beautiful, the first time I read it, my eyes were like, teared up. I'm like, oh, this is so nice. You know, it was teared up. And also when I now read it, something just dropped in my heart that this is just my Christ. You know, as humans, we go to God, you know, God, this is what I want. 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 You know, it's always we want, we want, we want, we want. And then God will, God is telling us, you know what? Have you done what I want? You know, number one, I have given you what you want because what you really want is Christ and I have given him to you. I have paid the price only, but what you need to do now next is to do the things that I want you to do, to trust me, take a step of faith, do the things that I want you to do. And the things that God wants us to do, they're in the Bible, they're in the word of God. The things that he wants us to do are in the word of God. I know that as Christians, when we become born again, you know, we're like, you know what, this is, okay, I'm born again now. Um, I, I have accepted the Lord as my savior and all of those things. Uh, what is next in my life? Especially when you are part of the organization with, that we're in, the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Once you become born again, you go through all the workers, um, you go through baptism and everything. The next thing, you have to be a worker. You cannot just be, um, um, what do you call it, a church member for a long time. You have to be a worker. And then for you to be, well, once you go through the workers' training, you're thinking, what department do I want to join? What do I want to be in? What do I want to serve in? And all of those things. And then and most times, children's ministry never, or, or youth ministry never come to, come to our mind. What comes to our mind is, you know what, I want to be an usher. I want to be in the choir. I want to do this. I want to do that. Which are all good because we need, the, the church needs everybody to be in right. the department, right. you know. Amen. But some of us, you know, even when God is speaking clearly to you that this is what I want you to do, you still just put God aside and you want to focus on what you want to do. And again, the way God works sometimes is in order for God to take you to your to, to where he has purpose for you, he will have to take you through some places in life. You have to go through some things in life. I tell people, I said, you know what, if you want to be I know we all, we all don't pray to be pastors. <laughs> you know, we say, I just want to um, be an usher, and that's it. But even for you to be an usher in a church, you need to have what they call long-suffering, patience. Because there are some people that will come into the church and will frustrate your life. I was once a worker. In fact, I think I've worked in every department. You know, you, people will frustrate your life. But how can you learn that? You learn it by where? going into the children's ministry. You start there first. Amen. You know, you say, you know what? I want to be a pastor. I want to be a pastor. That's my goal. For you to be a pastor, you're going to, you're going to deal with people, grown people. But before you deal with grown people, you need to go and deal with those little ones first. See how you can take it with them. And then you can now say, Father, I am ready. And so for sometimes God will have to prune us 
for us to get to a place of our destiny. God will have to prune us for us to be able to hear from God. I'm not saying that when I'm done today, everybody should get up and say, oh, this woman has said we are, should go. everybody, okay, we are all going to the children's ministry. We'll see who is going to be left here. That's not what I'm saying. But I know that God is speaking to some of us this morning. God is speaking to some of us this morning. And some of us, you know, even if it's to, we're good at multitasking. There are people that, you know, they are in a department, but when they need them in another department, they will show up. There are some departments that are not functional during service. That you can say, you know what, okay, if my department is not functioning during service, let me go and help out in a department once a month, twice a month. You know, whatever we want to do, whatever, whatever I want to do, or however God wants it, or however the church wants me to help out. So I'm um, going back to, to, my, to my story that I, that I just told us. So I have here, I wrote here, I said that I have often heard that you cannot really know the love of a parent until, the love of a child, sorry, until you become a parent. You know, some people, you hear them when they say, you know, that you, you hear people saying, oh, oh, somebody is talking about a child, about another person's child, and the mother hears, and she just goes all ballistic. Or she becomes so upset. She's like, why are you talking about my child? Why are you doing this? You know, because of the, the, the parents is acting out because of the love that she has. Every parent wants to def, uh, defend their children. Every parent wants to defend. So they say, you cannot know the love of a child until you are a parent. And it's not just until you are, what do you call it, biologically a parent. If you have the heart of a child at heart, you will defend any child any day. I have been in children, I was in youth ministry even before I got married, before I even thought of marriage. So even working and playing with children has always been part of me. So at that point, even when I see a child that needs something, um, even though that I wasn't married, I didn't have no children, there's still something, some part of me that will want to help that child. There's a say that says it takes a village to raise a child. And thankfully, I'm sure majority of us in here today were from Africa. And we know back then in Africa, they will tell you it takes a village, although sometimes we do it the wrong way. Because taking a village is not whooping because you're not my mother and then you will whoop me anyhow. That's not what we're, what we're saying. But we're saying it takes a village to raise a child, meaning, you know what, even if I live on the streets, I'm not going to mess up and go to the next street and mess up. Because I know that the people that live on the next streets, they know my parent, or they know that I lived the, the street behind, and so I'm not going to act out. Or even if I'm not in my neighborhood, and I go into another neighborhood or another subdivision, I will be scared to mess up, because my thinking is there's a parent here that will know my parents, or know somebody that knows my parents, and they're going to tell my parents. So that's what it means that we, when you say it takes a village to raise a child. So that child is aware that, you know what, I cannot afford to mess up because all eyes are on me. You know, all eyes are on me, so I cannot afford to mess up. So when we say that you cannot have, know the love of a child unless you're a parent, meaning that, you know, as a parent or as a Christian or as an adult, we need to just consciously, you know, sometimes put ourselves in place, especially we that are not either married or have children, put ourselves in a place of, you know, of a parent. Put ourselves in a place of a mother or a father to be able to know and feel those things. Um, here I said, I also read, I said, is there any limit to a parent's love? Thinking back to that story that I read to you, you said, if your child needed a kidney and you were a perfect match for that kidney, Will you give it to your child? Or will you say, you know what, ah, I have given back to you, that's it, you're on your own. Let's put you on the list, let them get you help. Or even though if you're you know, a perfect match. Or let's say that, you know what, they said, you know, your child, your child needs a heart transplant. And you're the only one that can give. Even before you, I mean, the, as a mother, the, the instincts that will come, the natural instincts that will come as a parent is, you know what, can I donate mine to my child? You know, so if we are able as parents to want to do that, or let me say you have your child and your child has a fever, and the fever is going up and going up and going up, the first thing we'll do is, you know, after praying or laying hands, we call the doctor. We want to take that child to the doctor. We want our child to be well. You know, your child is crying. 
you you get up you, the first reaction is what is happening are you okay you know you want to know that your child is okay you want to feel that your child is okay you know with all those physical things but you know the other things that we forget that we neglect is the spiritual things yes the physical things are good we want to make sure that our child um, our children are, are well we want to make sure that there is no no harm even as non-parents that are in this church you know the children that are in this church you go out on the street now and a child god forbid in this church was walking and there's a car coming and the child is not looking even that the child is not yours your first reaction will be what john you will run and grab that child out of the road right that's what we will do so it means we are caring for their physical needs but are we caring for their spiritual needs are we caring for our children's spiritual need and when i keep saying children i'm talking to everybody i want you to see yourself as a parent this morning see yourself as a mother even if you don't have a child see yourself as a father if you don't have a child yet are you caring for your child for the children in this church for their physical need are you caring for your child your spiritual child's physical and um, spiritual need i'm sorry um i'm going to read something to you uh, several years ago um, today's USA published an eye-opening result of a study of teens under stress when they were and um, when they asked them they said who do you turn to for help when you're in crisis these are teenagers the most popular choice was music the second choice was pairs so I'm in crisis I'm 14 the first person if I don't turn to music to music I called my I call my friend I say, hey, this is what I'm going through. Can you help? So it's like the blind leading the blind. Mm. Or you have a 14-year-old who gets pregnant. The first thing that she does is she picks up the phone and call another 14-year-old. Hey, I'm pregnant. What do you think I should do? And what would another 14-year-old tell her? So they said the second choice is pairs. The third one is TV. Wow. Amazing as this may sound, Mom were down the list at number 31. 31. So meaning that even before they tell their mother, they will tell their cats, they will talk to their dog, <laughs> they will write it on their, in their journal, they will do everything around the house. They will talk to the doctor, they will talk to the school nurse, they will talk to the school psychology, they will talk to the principal, they will talk to everybody but mom number 31 on the list. And you know what? Do you know where the dad number was? 48. 48. So just picture you have a child and the child is going through stuff. And you're thinking, before my child talked to me, my child would have spoken to 30 something people or things before they get to me. God forbid, Amen. if they don't get godly counsel. And why is this happening? That's the question I want you to be asking yourself. Why is this happening? Is, there, is it that there is something that we're not doing right as parents? That's, those are the things that we need to ask ourselves. We need to start questioning ourselves. If you're not a parent yet, this is a perfect time for you to start thinking so that when that time comes, you are ahead of the game. Dorothy Law Newton, she wrote something. She said, if a child lives in criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. Some of you are thinking, well, this children business is too much. Thank God I'm not a parent yet. So good luck to those parents. I'm going to read something for us. Matthew 18, 1 to 6. Matthew 18, 1 to 6.
Matthew 18, 1 to 6, it says, At this time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, As surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in, my, in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And I want you to pay attention, close attention to this uh, verse 6. He said, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So Jesus is telling us how special, how important the little kids are, the ch our children are. And he's not telling us that whoever causes these little ones to sin, it is better for you not to even think of making it into the kingdom of God. Just look for somebody to put a millstone around your neck and throw you in the sea. And, and not even think of having a relationship with me. So if God is saying this, if Jesus is telling us this, then what does he say? What does he say about our children? He means that God owes them, I mean, they're very special to God. They are very, very, very special in God's sight. And so what are we doing? And then we look at our society today and we say, what is going on in our society? You look at the children, you look at what is going on and we're like, where is God? God is still God, but the thing is, where are the adults? What are we doing? We have the church. The church is there to help nurture those children. The church is there to help mold the children. The church is there to help, you know, raise them in the way God has ordained, that God has purpose. But for some reason, the church is failing. And why is it that the church is failing? It is not the pastor's fault, because I know some of you might be thinking, well, the church is failing. It's not my church. It is Pastor Dara's church. It's not the pastor's fault. It is everybody's fault. You need to look at your children's ministry. See what is going on in the children's ministry. Talk to the teachers. Talk to the leaders there. See if they need help. We might say, you know what, I was not born to be a teacher. I'm not a teacher, so why would I go and teach in the children's ministry? Let them have teachers teach. The people that they are not teachers. I was not a teacher. My first degree was in IT. It was in IT, and I never worked a day's job with that before I went back to school and did, you know, went for education. So you don't say, because I'm not a teacher, they don't need me there. You go and ask them what they need. Even if I have to volunteer myself once a month. If I have to volunteer myself once in three months. Once a month, not listening to the pastor preach will not stop you from entering the kingdom of God. But you know what? Because you are, you are in the children's ministry, you are investing in the future. It's like you are putting, you're, you're putting money in your savings account. That's what you're doing because you're investing in them. Because these children need help. The teachers that are there, they are there to help. But we have less teachers, more children. You can imagine in a household, at least you have a minimum of two or three children. So in a church where you have, let's say you have 20 adults in a church. If 10 of them are married with children and the other 10 are single, do the math. Those 10 that are married with children, at least the average will have maybe two kids. So it means that the children that will be in the children's church of adults, 20 adult members, will be close to maybe 30, 40 children. And then you have maybe two people helping out in the room to teach these children, to train them in the way of the Lord. How is that going to be possible? Two adults to about 30 children. So you have one adult to what, 15 children? It is difficult. It is hard. There are people that want to do this. There are people that God has called to be teachers, to teach children's ministry. But you know what? Even while they are teaching, they need help. They need an adult in the room. Just to even sit in the room and be a second person. To just help so that the kids can listen while they are teaching. That's what they are asking for. Because when you have two adults in a room, and not just one, it makes the, the work easier for one person. 
Or when you have given more than two, it makes the work easier for one person. They're not asking you to come and teach. They just ask you to come and be part of what is happening in the children's ministry. Come and be part of what is happening in the life of the children, in the life of the next generation in your church. And that is why when you look at it now, a lot of our teenagers, by the time they go into college, we're losing them. Why are we losing them? Because the foundation is not solid. We're living, but when we're in children's ministry, uh, we had about three, you will have about um, 30, 30 children with one teacher, or 30, uh, 20 children with one teacher. So that teacher will do her best, go home every day frustrated, come back angry on Sundays. Some teachers on Saturday nights, they become angry because they know they are coming to church. They love the job, but they know that they are coming and they are going to be frustrated because there will be a, a boy or a girl that is going to be, that is going to destroy, I mean, disturb their life. So they come in and just do what they want, to, what they can do. They won't put their all into it. And so these children, they go from one teacher to another and they move into the youth ministry. I remember when I was in the youth ministry, sometimes we tell our children, we say, can you open to the book of Habakkuk? And they're looking at you. And these are the children that graduated from children's church. That we did graduation for the church, brought them to the main church. The pastor prayed for them, lay hands on them. As you're going into the youth ministry, you're going to excel, you're going to do this. And then they tell them, open to the book of Nehemiah. And then you're like, John, can you open to the book of Nehemiah? Is that in the Bible? <laughs> like, huh? Or can you open to the book of Luke? Oh, Luke, I've heard about it. Is it New Testament or Old Testament, auntie? Huh? Where? Is it at the back or what? Just tell me what page, auntie. I want to know what page it is. And they will say, go to the front and check. And then they go to the front. Oh, I think it's at the back. Okay, it's at the back. What is the back? Is the back the old or the new? You're like, um, if it's at the back, it's probably the old. Because it's old. They have no clue. So we have to start afresh. And teaching 13 year olds and they've been in church for 13 for they've been in church all their life since they were born from 0 to 12 before they came to the youth ministry what were they teaching them then zero or they were teaching them but they were not able to impact them I would say zero because the teachers are trying but they're not impacting those children so we now have to start again at least for the next four years that they are with us before they go to college we now have to do our, our best and then when they go to college, God help us. Because those children, because even that when the research, research says that you can, a, a, before a child turn 13, I mean 14 or 15, that is the best time to reach them for Christ. Amen. Once they are 14, it is very difficult to reach them. It is very difficult to teach them. Because when they are young, they are like blank slates. So you're just writing on them writing on them and then you're writing the scriptures all over them. But by the time they're 13 or 14, they have they started making up, I mean, they're set in their ways. They know what they want to do at 13. They know what they want to become. Yesterday I was telling the teachers, I said I have a 13, 14 year old girl. I said at 14, in fact it was at 13, she knows where she's going to get married. Where she's going to get married, she knows. She has picked out her wedding dress. She has picked out her wedding color. She has picked out her wedding shoe. She has picked out everything. Everything, Pinterest, everything on her folder. Not only that, she has picked, she knows what school she wants to go to, the college she wants to go to. She knows the state it, 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 the college is in. I am even telling her, I said, you know what, at least pick another, pick second choice. I said, normally you have at least three choices. She said, mommy, no, this is where I'm gonna go. That's where I want to go, and that's it. I'm like, what if I don't want to be? I don't want to be non-spiritual. I don't want to say what if they don't say, accept you. I'm like, what if it doesn't work out? He said, Mom, that's where I want to go. It's gonna work out. I've looked at it. I know what they're asking for. I know the requirement. I know what I have to do when I am in high school because she's already in high school. So I know what I have to do. So don't worry about me. I'm like, why don't you stay in Dallas? She said, mm, I'm not staying. She knows what she wants at 13. She knows what she wants to become at 13. And I, you would think, okay, maybe because it's a phase. That was last year, 13. She's now 14. When you ask her, she's still set on what she wants to be. She knows that she's not going back. So the classes she's picking, I mean, picking in school are towards what she wants to be. 
in college, what she wants to be when she grow up. And I was telling her, see, when I was 13, I didn't know what I want to be. I said, when I was 13, I think I was telling everybody I want to be a, gymnast, uh, a gymnast. And around with the boys in my neighborhood, I'll be flipping. When they flip, I flip. I'm very competitive. When they flip twice, I flip twice. When they flip three times, I'll flip three times. Because I say, I want to say, if I was born in this country and I was raised in this country, because I came to this country when I was 21. By that time, they won't accept you into Olympics anymore. <laughs> I said, if I was born in this country, I'll probably be a gymnast. Because it was, it was there. And then after a while, maybe after two, three years, because I loved one of the newscasters in Nigeria. A, a lady, um, um, her name just went off my head. And I'll tell everybody I want to be a newscaster. And then after that, that changed. I said I want to go into the Navy. So I was changing, but they know what they want to be. So that's why we have to start early and instill in them the word of God. We have to start early and do whatever we can to help these children to be the children that the God has called them to be. Some of us, the reason why we are in church today is because when we're growing up, our parents made us go to church. Our parents made us read our Bible. Even as adults, we don't want to read our Bible. Our parents made us read our Bible. I remember when I was growing up in my house, I grew up in a Catholic home, but my father, when he wakes up in the morning, before we, even when he wakes up and he has not said his prayers, and he walks through the hallway, maybe he's going somewhere um, to the kitchen to get water or something, and we come out, we see him, and we say, good morning, daddy. He will not answer. He wakes up pretty early. My dad wakes up like 3 a.m. I don't know if that man sleeps at all. You know? And he will not answer you. But if he answers you, it means he has said his prayer. He will not answer because he has not said his prayers. He was not a pastor. He was not. But that was how he grew up. And because of that, you know, I saw in him. And then when, he's, when, when he goes back to, into his room, he's on his, in, he's, he's, he's on his knee for like an hour praying. I'm like, what is this man doing for an hour? But guess what? When I became a Christian, a born again Christian, that thing was in me. Because I'm like, okay, now I, I now understood more on, why he was praying. Amen. Amen. So prayer comes naturally to me. It comes naturally to me. Because I saw that in my father. I was telling people, I said, even when, if you, whatever the children see you do as young, um, as young as they are, that's what they will do when they are older. People that, people that have children today, you see sometimes your children are doing stuff. And you remember that you did exactly the same thing. Pastor and I was talking yesterday, and we we're talking about that. And you're like, wow, this reminds me of me. And you know, and they don't even know why you did it. Maybe something that you did when you were young. And you just see one of your child will just repeat the same thing. So please, what are we teaching these children? We need to help our children. We need to set the bar, the, the bar for them. We need to help them. Whether they are your biological children or not, a child or not, please, they need your help. We need to step into the classroom. We need to help them in the classroom. When you look at even when you look at the school system, go and Google it, and Google what makes a school district an exemplary school district. What they will put there, they will tell you that that school district they have high parental involvement. So when you're very involved in the ministry, in your, in your child's, in children's life, they will do well. When they see you constantly, they will do well. When there are adults there, they will do well. In my school district, it's one of the best in the country. It's not all the parents that are involved there, but you know why they're doing well? Because when you go to the school every day, you would think some of the parents that are hired, they, they, they leave there. They just come to volunteer. And so all the children are doing well. So please, uh, we're praying, we're asking us, please, we need to go back. We need to help our children to be the people, the children that God has called them to be. Because we do not want these children to fail. We do not want these children for the world to take them. But we want them to grow up in the way, in the nurture, in the admonition of the Lord. And how can they do it? Is the, the, you and I come stepping up and saying, you know what, pastor, what can we do? You don't have to teach them. You might say, you know what, oh, this is, I can only, I, I, I don't like children, but tell me, 
Um, I can bring something. I can come and help clean after they leave the room. I can come and clean the room so the teachers don't have to clean. Oh, I love, I'm very I, I, I energetic. I can do games. You know, there are things, you don't have to be a teacher. Just be creative. Look for what you can do. Or you know what? Oh, their classrooms. Um, it's so boring. I'm not a designer. But you know what? This is my idea. But this is what I can give. We were, we were renovating our children's department. And one of the ushers, one day just said something. He said, you know what? Oh, you know when they, that you guys, that we should have put um, uh, an hallway inside instead of outside. You know, because the way they did it. You know, and what he said actually makes sense. But it's too, it is not too late. It's too late because they've already done, completed the renovation. And for us to do that, it's going to cost money. And you know what he told me? He said, Pastor Gloria, you know what? I said, you know what you said is very, very good. This is an usher. His first child is, what, two and a half. And he said, you know, um, I said, but it's too late now. I said, I wish that we knew this ahead of time. He said, you know, why don't you ask the facility if they can still do it? I will give $500. This is even an African-American guy who's married to a Nigerian girl. He said, I'll give $500. I don't know how much it's going to cost, but that, will, but that will come from me. Just tell them. So even if it's $20 I want to give, I said, this is what I'm going to give every month. Or once a month, or once a year. You know, I just want to be a blessing in the children's midst. And as we do that, I know that God Almighty will help us in Jesus' name. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for your church. Thank you, Lord, for the people that you have called into your house, Father. Father, Lord God Almighty, although the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered of you. Father, Lord, we know that when you call us, you will equip us. Father, Lord Almighty, I know that you have called each and every one of us into your ministry. You have called each and every one of us into your kingdom. Father, Lord, we pray that what we will need, how we're going to do it, that we don't know. Father, Lord, we pray that you reveal to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you, O oh God Almighty, that if there be anybody in, in here this morning that is saying, Father, I still don't know what you want me to do. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you will speak to them, O oh God. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we pray that our children, Father, will be for signs and wonders. Amen. And we pray that our children will not go astray. Amen. We pray, Lord God Almighty, that our children, Father, Lord God Almighty, will be the Esther of their generation. Amen. We pray that our children, Father, Lord, will be, Father, Lord, the Samuel of their generation. Generation. Amen. Father, we pray that our children will be the Joshua of their generation. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, for this one, oh God. Father, also, we thank you for our teachers, oh God Almighty, that you are using, Father, Lord, mightily in the life of these ones. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you will continue to strengthen them, Amen. you continue to empower them. Father, you continue to give them the resources that they need. Father, Lord, to, to, to teach these children, oh God. And Father, Lord, we pray that your church, Father, you will bless, Amen. Father, that your church will go from grace to grace oh god Amen. father lord god almighty that your church will go father lord from glory to glory father father all that the, your church need father you will provide father we thank you we bless you we give you all the glory and adoration Amen. for in jesus name we pray Amen. Amen.